Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the press conference for Belfast. What did you all think of the movie? My name is Scott Nance. I'm very excited and very honored to be moderating our press conference this morning. Before we get started, I uh, just want to just uh, take care of some housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times, uh, in, even when you are asking questions. Uh, I also want to point out that in an effort to remain COVID safe, there will be three designated microphones around the room. Uh, when you have a question, please raise your hand and we will hand you the mic. And when you are done with the question, please give the microphone back to the person who gave it to you so we can sanitize the mic and give it to the next person. Uh, really, really appreciate your help with this. So without further ado, let us start our press conference for Belfast, which won the People's Choice Award just recently at the Toronto International <laughs> Film Festival. Please welcome to the stage as Pop, Kieran Hines. As Buddy, introducing Jude Hill. As Pa, welcome Jamie Dornan. As Ma, Katrina Bauf. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for writer, director, Kenneth Branagh. You're not going to. All right. Is that too low for you? Morning. All right. Well, first of all, the first question I, I have for, for, for each of you is, I know we just had the, your big premiere last night at the, at the Academy Museum Theater, which was absolutely uh, a wonderful, wonderful event. I loved your introduction. Thanks. And Ken, you, know, you, you mentioned your premiere that you had in Belfast. Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, what, that's a pretty, pretty big uh, premiere to have. What was that like? What was the reaction? It was amazing. I was just saying, actually, that it feels like from Thursday night, um, thank you, strong man at last. Uh, <laughs> um, from Thursday night um, through to last night, it felt like one long party. Um, it was a great night last night. I felt there was a, that was a really wonderful party, actually, because it felt like everybody was, everybody was in the same place. Your man gets up and sings, which is a big surprise and a brilliant thing, you know. Uh, and that was like a sort of sense of the atmosphere, to answer your question, back in Belfast, where 1,400 people watched the movie in the Waterfront Hall. That's so many people, isn't it, to see a, to see a, a, a film together. It was a lot of people last night as well. Both of those experiences of us all being back together watching movies um, that get you, as it were, up on your feet and reacting uh, was really amazing. And for us who were going uh, home in various ways, uh, to, to have the reaction of the home crowd was, was, was electric. It was an absolutely electric evening, very, very emotional, very emotional. I, we, I struggled to say much uh, for a while, uh, but everybody was there, and Van Morrison was there, and you know every kind of community group was there, and it felt like the, 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 the city was, was right behind us. And, 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 and when you think of the story of the film, and uh, frankly, I still get amazed to think of coming from those streets and ending up here and ending up where we were last night. It's sort of surreal, unbelievable, beautiful, and I was very glad to be with you all last night, just uh, you know, kicking it up. It was great, it was great. Katrina, one of the things that really struck me the first time I saw the film at the Telluride Film Festival, which I believe was the world premiere for the movie, Correct. is the warmth, the family, it feels so genuine and authentic. How do you all bond to to feel like a family? Um, <laughs> well, it was very difficult to know. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I think sometimes there's just an alchemy and a magic that happens, and I think it's down to Ken um, creating the space for that. Um, you know, one of our first days, Ken had uh, Judy, Kieran, Jamie, and myself in a room, 
And he, you, you, know, you asked us questions about our childhood, about our parents, our grandparents, you shared a lot of stories, and that very quickly got us all just to know each other on a very intimate level and on a very personal level. And I think that that really broke down any kind of, I mean, for me, I was very intimidated walking into that room, but um, you know, very quickly you just, everyone sort of got along and, and knew each other on a very kind of real level. And that's, I think that starts everything off on a very open kind of playing field. So it just continued from there. Jamie, I want to ask you that you, you started filming this movie in uh, September of 2020. Oh, August, August. August. Okay, August of 2020. Yeah. So, what were the challenges, the acting challenges for you and for everyone in the cast to to make a film during a global pandemic? Yeah. Listen, it's it, it, it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of uh, protocol that we had that was unusual and alien to all of us, getting COVID tested every day. Um, having this strange one-way system on to set and like each um, sort of uh, department would get their time, you know, um, the sound would get their moment and then the props would get their moment and everyone was just coming in and this sort of like uh, in phases, it was very strange. But I think the overriding feeling for all of us was that we were so fortunate to be making something, you know, we were all sitting around um, really clueless as to when the next job was going to come and <laughs> nothing was shooting we were the you know first out of the gate in the UK particularly uh, so we we were just felt lucky to be employed you know um, <laughs> let alone employed on something that is so uh, was so meaningful to me personally certainly and and to, to all of us and uh, with such an incredible piece of work to for us to play with um, so that was the overriding feeling, and you were just happy to do all the protocols and keep everybody safe because we were so felt fo so fortunate to be there to be able to tell that story. Hi, Jude. Hello. Uh, I'm going to say something to you that you're going to hear a lot. You were awesome in this movie. Thank you. <laughs> How did you find out you got the job? Well. Um I remember when the email came through, I ran around my house screaming for about five minutes. <laughs> and I didn't even get halfway through the email, and I read it all, and I found out who would be in it. And I was amazed, because my mum and dad knew all these actors, and I knew some of them as well. And it was just, <laughs> it was just crazy. Which and ones did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was just crazy. <laughs> Kieran, what, what impressed you the most about, about you? This is his very first feature film. Um, yeah, when um, I was introduced to Jude the first time, and uh, Ken had uh, told me um, that he was an Irish dancer. Um, it struck a chord with me because I did Irish dancing for about 15 years myself, and I thought, I wonder what this little fella is like. And in this open-hearted, uh, imaginative, brilliant young fella walked, and uh, I knew within a couple of seconds that we were going to have a, a real adventure making the film because he was a gift to us from Ken, and I think now you'll understand he's a gift to the world as well. Yeah. <laughs> One more question for Ken uh, before I open up to the audience. So I was really moved by your introduction last night at the Academy Museum premiere. This is a very personal film for you. It has been in your head for 50 years. Uh, why was now the right time to tell the story and, and to write this story? Um, well, you know, it came out of uh, that, that silence that we, a lot of us stared into at the beginning of the, of the lockdown. And um, it certainly sent me back to this, this other lockdown that we experienced where the both ends of the street were, were barricaded. And, um, you know, you, you ended up looking inward. I think a lot of us did this during the pandemic and uh, separated from things that were so familiar to us that we perhaps took for granted, and particularly from people that we took for granted. I think um, it was a chance to look back. I wanted to shake hands with the nine-year-old kid. Um, and um, yeah, 
Yeah, and, and also try and understand what my parents had gone through. I think that people in this pandemic, a lot of people made enormous numbers of sacrifices. And um, I think in this time and in these communities, people did. And those sacrifices, those family moments, I think a lot of people from around the world understand. You know, we all have our versions of them. And it seems to me one of the beautiful things that the film seems to have unlocked for people is a moments in their own life when, I don't know, they're suddenly told that Father Christmas doesn't exist. He does, Jude, by the way. He does. Um, <laughs> he does. But, but, it, but if you thought that he didn't, sometimes when that knowledge comes your way, um, it can be difficult. Um, and I think... Uh, that just, you know, when you leave, when you leave in whatever sense, a home or a place, I think that that readjustment involves dealing with some form of loss, which can be um, painful and the result can also be beautiful, but it's, it's bittersweet, I guess, like, like life is sometimes. And going back to look at it at a time when we were all considering those difficult, you know, losses in our own lives and, and what is valuable to us sort of meant that it sort of had to come out. Yeah, just one more thing. Uh, you talk about your nine-year-old self here. What made Jude the perfect buddy? Who were you looking for and what made Jude just perfect? Well, I think as you'll have seen and as we all know, um, and I would say actually, you know, just apropos of your first question, one of the things about this group of actors, Katrina was just talking about what, what made the atmosphere, I would say Judy, the distinguished Judy Dench, who isn't here, one of the things she said to me once, I remember thinking it's very unusual as an actor to say this. We were talking about the reaction of people um, in the world about her work or whatever, and it came out and she just said, well, the thing is, Ken, I like people. I like meeting people. And I would say that this group of actors like meeting people. It was the, the, the example last night. It was nice, you know, the, it was nice to be amongst everybody, you know? It was a good, we were ha happy about this. Don't need to be in some separate room or be, you know, sort of kind of, you know, filtered. So all of that energy was going up. Jude, I think, has the same thing. Also, he had, I think, uh, they, th th this group also share a sense of humor, so does uh, this one here. But I think, um, <laughs> I think that uh, the, the biggest thing, w and again shared by these other actors, was the capacity to listen. A lot of Buddy's performance was about, re it's about reacting, isn't it? It's about listening and watching, not necessarily saying things, and acting on film often is reacting, so it needed to be somebody who could do that in, in that very moment. Now, he had a lot of great people to listen to, so uh, another thing to say, much as I love young Jude here, and he's amazing, but uh, it was a group thing, so a lot of that performance was given to him also by these distinguished characters, and, but he gave it all right back with a capacity to be present, which is so beautiful. Jude, uh, what was it like working with Kieran, with Jamie, with Katrina? Like, what did you learn from them? I learned so much from each and every one of them. Huh. Uh, yeah, I mostly just asked for a bunch of advice about acting, and that really helped me understand the acting community a lot better. And even working with Ken and having him as my director and writer is just mind-blowing. <laughs> 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 and each and every single one of these actors is extremely talented, and they're all just really, really nice people. So, so this is your first film. Jude, you want to do it again? Uh, 101%. <laughs> All right, let's turn it over to the audience. And uh, uh, when you get the microphone, uh, I ask that you state your name and your outlet. And I'm going to start uh, uh, you in the mask and the glasses. <laughs> Say that a lot today, you in the mask. <laughs> no, we, we do need the microphone. I do. Um, hi, yeah, Chris uh, from Joe Blow in, in Montreal. Um, you said something pretty interesting last night, uh, uh, Kenneth, about uh, how um, even during dark times, there are moments of, of happiness, and I think that a lot of us can relate to that, having come out of a pretty dark time, COVID-19. Um, but I wanted to know, uh, it feels almost perfectly timed, this movie, because seeing it with an audience feels almost like a cathartic experience. Mm. And are you hoping that perhaps a mass audience views this movie the same way, because it does feel kind of ideally timed in that respect. Well, um, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, uh, we found both these recent experiences with these large numbers of people, I, I, I saw and experienced and felt the, the movie in a different way. And I felt, you know, there's a way in which you can uh, understand silence 
the nature of silence. You know, I've made a few films where the silences were not good. Um, <laughs> they, there was the, a silence representing no other factor but boredom um, or, or disinterest and eventual an exit from the room. But I think here, I feel people lean in to some of the family problems. I feel them, I feel them care. I, fe I feel a real personal interest I think the investment, the human investment, is just something, and I'm thrilled, of course, that it's happening around our film, but I think it's independent of our film, of course, and I'm sure it's happening in lots of other experiences that people have in the world, but I think it's to do with maybe us not being fully put back together again after what we've been through. There's still a couple of layers of skin missing, and maybe we, we need some em emotional release, and storytelling has always helped provide that. We, you know, we read to know that we are not alone, and, and this movie definitely, I think, tries to let people know that we need not be alone. Katrina, I'd love to hear your take on that. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> how, how do I better for that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, again, like when we saw the film uh, on Thursday in Belfast, I, I definitely had a new experience watching it. I mean, I was watching it with my mother, which was such a special thing for me. It was the first premiere she'd ever come to. Um, and there's so much of her that I, I drew from uh, for my performance. And, you know, I think, yeah, I just think it's, it's that thing of we've, I mean, for me personally, it was, it was a really quiet, very uh, still four or five months before we started filming. And then right after we filmed, we went into another lockdown. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, I was very blessed. None, nobody in my family got ill, but it, it was a very introspective and a very, I think it was a tough time for everybody. And, and I do think that this has been, it's been such a, it's been such a joyful experience bringing this film to people watching it watching people be moved by it i mean my mom turned around to me and she said you know i just didn't want the film to end and that was like the most special thing that i heard so um yeah it's, it's just been really special that's an actual unanimous feeling i didn't want the film to end either <laughs> jamie you know you, you you made this film you all made this film under trying circumstances mm -hmm. you had your premiere in belfast and you are a belfast man mm -hmm. How, what kind of responsibility, how important was this movie for you? Um, I just, you know, couldn't be, you know, we've taken this film to many parts of the world. We've screened it uh, very successfully. The response to the movie has been um, very positive. Uh, it's been very pleasing. It's not always the case particularly for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we care so much what people from Belfast think of this movie. Um, it's not strictly only for the people of Belfast, but um, God, they're important. And the story of the people and what people from that part of the world have, have been through is, is vitally important. Um, it's been told in many different guises before. Uh, to uh, success and you know there's a place for what Jim Sheridan did in the 90s and, and recent films that are, are focused more on the sort of um, the, the, the troubles themselves but to see a normal hard-working family and uh, the impact that uh, the beginning of a conflict had on them I think it's really important um, so Thursday night was one of the most remarkable experiences of, of my life um, to get to share it with those people and for those people to have embraced it. And um, we felt a very palpable sense of love in that room and that just meant so much to, to all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go over to this side. Wow, everyone. <coughs> uh, right over here on the side here. And uh, again, please state your name and the name of your outlet. Hi, Danielle Salzman, Salzy at the Movies. And uh, my question is, can you talk about the uh, process and uh, filming uh, the everlasting love sequence on set? Well, I, I can I, I can just briefly say that um, Alita, our choreographer, um, was involved, but I essentially handed it over to <laughs> the brilliant and beautiful Katrina Balfe and Jamie Dorn. And so tell us, how was it? I know you rehearsed a lot. <laughs> well, we had to. <laughs> uh, 
well, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would venture to say uh, neither Jamie or I are natural dancers. <laughs> Maybe Jamie more than me. Um, no, it, it was, I mean, beautiful choreography by Alita. We, it was, we were shooting a lot of the time in a, in a heat wave. So there was many <laughs> sweaty, sweaty sessions of dance rehearsals um, where we were learning these, uh, this choreography in like 35 Celsius. Um, but it, I think it, it's, it comes at such an important part in the story. And for Ma and Pa, you know, for these two characters, it's really where the stresses on their marriage are, have sort of come to a height. And I think it really needed this moment for them to remember the, you know, the foundation of love that they have for each other. And I think that's what's the most powerful thing in that scene is you see that despite all the things that are happening around them, these are two people who love each other so purely. Um, and then, of course, the wonderful singing by Jamie Dornan. Well, listen, I'll tell you what was a godsend that day was that the vocal I recorded for it, we did after, we did it after um, the production, so I wasn't having to sing live, it wasn't like, you know, Les Miserables or whatever, where they're all singing live. <laughs> um, I don't think I would have survived the day if I had to do that. It was hard enough trying to lip sync in time uh, on the day and deal with the dance moves and uh, all the emotion that was wrapped up in, in that moment. And I agree with, with um, Katrina in terms of like the release of it. I feel it comes at a time in that movie where you've been through so many difficult moments and suddenly um, there's this joyous release and uh, it's, it's, it's vitally important and to see it through his eyes. And you know, that day was filled with terror, really, and uh, fear. Um, but I was just getting so much back from this one and uh, from this one and everyone that was, you know, obviously, Kieran was like the only one who wasn't with us that day. For, <laughs> for oh, I couldn't be bothered turning up. <laughs> he wouldn't even lie in the coffin. It was really, you know, um, <laughs> strange. <laughs> um, but it did. It felt like, you know, you know, Bar Kieran, the whole gang were there, and um, it was very special. And uh, it will be a day I'll never, I'll never forget that day. You know? Do you remember there was a, when we were talking about what was underneath it as well? I remember what came to mind uh, was a volume of poetry by D. H. Lawrence, and it was written. It was a series of short poems uh, that were written after um, he uh, eloped with Frida Weekly. She had children. She left her children. It couldn't have been more difficult. Um, and the, this very simple but beautiful. Um, at least in, to my mind, in a volume uh, that, that they wrote. And I remember talking to you about this, about what, what should this look be uh, that she, when she looks back to Pa. And the title of the volume was Look, We Have Come Through. And for me, that was what, you know, yes, it was a, it was a, a pop song that they danced to, but it was about, you know what, I think we got through this next bit. Look, we have come through. And what was great about these two was you could have them in a sweaty chapel for, for four weeks rehearsing, but also talk about notes like that, and they could do both. So they do all the jiggling and joggling. But I really think that there's a couple of looks in there between the pair and them that go so deep in terms of understanding that, that it, it matches what, the, it isn't just as it were the power of cheap music, as some people would put it. Uh, it it's just a, a connection to the depth of the relationship. And it was lovely to have actors who were responsive to both things. Let's go over to right over here. <coughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, Chuck Kaplinski, WCIA TV, Real Talk with Chuck and Pam. Gary Cooper is my favorite film actor of all time. Thank you. <laughs> it was great to see him on the screen last night and the way you <laughs> used him. If I had the opportunity to make a film about a section of my life, I do, would only hope it would be half as beautiful as what you've all accomplished. Thank you. What you've done is given us a real gift. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brown, what happens next? How did your family adjust to the move? We know what happened with your life, but wow. how did your family, uh, your parents deal with the uh, move and the adjustment and your brother as well? Uh, it was tough, I'll be honest with you, it was tough. I think that the, uh, the, the sacrifice that uh, uh, Katrina so beautifully describes in the scene on the bus um, had, its, uh, had its impact. I think that the, uh, the first part of life was the illustration of the idea that it takes a village to raise a child and then um, the village wasn't there. 
and uh, safety was there, protection from violence was there, um, but and economic opportunity was there. But the um, yeah, that that I think it was tre tremendously, tremendously hard for for everybody. And although, and one of the reasons that you know, it's such a stupid and obvious thing to say, one of the reasons to do the film was we never, ever, 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 ever talked about it. We just did. We just didn't. We got. A, they were so certain. They, they they so wanted to make the sacrifice work. You couldn't look back. Plus, an Irish thing is don't dwell, don't indulge. Other people are always worse off. So forget about your suffering. It isn't suffering. Listen, you got a chance. You got a job. You got to go. You got out. She said go. You know, and and so get on with it. But um, 50 years on, I I needed to. But it was tough for them. In the end, they had beautiful, 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 beautiful moments. Uh, but. Uh, you give something up. There's no question. And what they gave up was was what they gave up was 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 significant. Um, but they were very lucky in and blessed in all sorts of other ways. Uh, Kieran, I want to ask you. Uh, you were also from from Belfast. Yep. Uh, so I mean, the the responsibility that you had, and also projecting a film that was about family, but also about about what went down in Belfast in 1969. Uh, yeah. I mean. Um when Ken sent me the script and uh, I picked it up, and uh, it just from, I guess, I, page one, I looked, I turned over to page two, and for some reason, um, it started to go straight into my brain and my heart because uh, uh, the rhythm in which he'd written it and what he was talking about, I had experienced myself in a slightly different fashion. But we grew up half a mile from each other in Belfast. Uh, I have a few years on him. Um, <laughs> But um, the connection to the material uh, was kind of huge to me, quietly huge. I wouldn't go out screaming about it, but um, he just captured in his writing the truth of the situation, but placed into a kind of dramatic form. But it's as true as anything I would uh, remember about filmmaking of Belfast at the heart uh, of the story the love and the connection of the people uh, was, to me, so pure that uh, the least we could do was to do justice to Ken and to his family. Back to this side, right here, front row, Bond with the mask. <coughs> <laughs> Hi, first of all, congratulations. One of my favorite movies of the year, This and Barb and Star. Um, I loved it so much. I, one of my favorite scenes of the movie is the scene between Ma and Pa, where Pa acknowledges that Ma raised the kids just so beautifully. Yeah. I thought that moment was so impactful for the story. So Jamie and Katrina, can you talk about your memories of filming that scene and also getting the direction from Ken as well? <laughs> oh, and Lauren Veneziani, DC Film Girl in NBC Baltimore, thank you. Um, <laughs> that was the, the scene when I, you know, you know, I, 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 I think I, I'd said yes in my mind before I even opened the script, based on the you know, personnel uh, surrounding the film. But um, that was the moment that really like punctured me in the script. Um, so when we shot that scene, uh, we we shot it first from the angle that it plays in, and you know. By the way, this one fell asleep for real. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that says is about there, what Balfour really and I were getting up to. There's a really soundtrack of little <laughs> snores throughout that scene. Uh, yeah, not great for the confidence, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, he's very method. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but we shot it from down there, and um, which is a beautiful, beautiful image. And uh, I th I'm allowed, I can, I can say this. Ken took me aside after and said, listen, um, I don't think we need to come in for coverage, like tight coverage. I was like, mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> 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 but actually, you know, I trust this man more than any director I've ever trusted before. So, um, you know, I had to put my own personal um, sort of ambition of, a, 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 you know, a nice tight, uh, Close shot for that for that, that you know very important scene aside, and uh, <laughs> which was difficult. Um, but I think uh, I think it's far more impactful the way the way it plays. And at the end of the day, we are discussing the two boys, um, and uh, in, a, in a very um, sincere 
and uh, emotional way. Um, so to have them included in the shot for the entirety while we discuss that, I think is really beautiful thing. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, it was a, it was a, a wonderful scene to shoot because it meant you know that was the most impactful scene that I that I read and. She's just the easiest person in the world to work with. So, Your take, Katrina? Yeah, I mean, it is. It's such a gorgeous moment between these two characters. You know, I think so often, I, you know, I will say, first of all, I think the men in this film are some of the most beautiful and big-hearted characters, and they really, you know, you feel the empathy and the love from them, but very often it's the women who are left bearing the brunt of things in, the, in these kind of situations and it's not often acknowledged and sometimes I think people talk about stay-at-home mothers in this very dismissive way and sort of reduce them to sort of like, well, they're just another wife. Or, mm -hmm. And I think that this was a beautiful moment that really acknowledged the weight and the, the enormity of what Ma was doing and what a lot of women do. And I thought that that was a really beautiful moment. The one, one thing I'd say also about that, about these two as well, is before that, the same morning, in fact, what had caused Jude to fall asleep was that we'd done the scene ahead of that where he's on the sofa and, they are, and, and he you know, says he doesn't want to leave Belfast. And because of what I'd written, I thought it was quite a hard thing for Jude to come in and sort of do straight away. We were into a sort of pitch of emotion. So I said to uh, Jamie and Katrina, would you mind, in all, can we improvise the scene before that, you know, where you've begun, I, I had written something where he comes in with, I don't want to leave Belfast, and this, the conversation already happened. I said, would you mind improvising the scene that isn't written? Um, and they were absolutely brilliant at doing that. And what, part of what informed the scene you've just been talking about was that, and it's a sort of, it's pretty, it's scary, I think, but it was wonderful to see uh, they were helping Jude out because that meant he could have a run up to this explosion, but also this sort of tentative, how on earth do you tell the child that you're gonna be taking him away from everything? And I was really grateful. It's one of the enormous contributions that every bit of all these actors in this cast made and enhanced and improved and uh, added to the script. And that beautiful beat supports the scene that they did. One of the reasons I chose one angle was because the, the energy in the room and what they'd given to that was so beautiful. And it was all from them. Excellent. Okay, let's go. Uh, yellow shirt. Yes. Wait, hang on. Wait for the mic. Hi, I'm Terry Hart from Toronto, uh, Super Channel and CBC. Um, you might have not got your close up uh, for that scene, Jamie, but Mr. Brenna, you definitely made some bold choices around really extreme close ups throughout the movie. And I'm wondering if that was stylistically your choice when you were writing and you wanted that intimacy with those extreme close ups, or was it on set with your actors and their faces that allowed you to go in and follow up, um, what do you think that added for the audience, for the viewer, to be intimate with these characters that an extreme close-up allows? Um, thank you for, for that question. The, I think a combination of things apply. The black and white was partly chosen for a forensic quality, something that Harris Sambalukos, our cinematographer, put this way, he said, look, color, of course, allows you brilliantly to describe people, but black and white allows you to feel people. You take away some, some things that you might otherwise uh, look at, and you look more closely at them. Um, and uh, I've always thought that it's possible to make uh, epic films in intimate situations. Um, and in cinema, the reason to, to invest in this, in, in the big screen experience, is that an epic dimension of black and white photography on a massive screen is the human face. So what might otherwise be the sweeping landscape of a desert or a mountain range or whatever, in black and white, when the scene has earned the right to look in this way, uh, a specific example being um, Judy Dench uh, at the end where she sort of, um, um, you know, from some unknown depths that only somebody like Judy can have, has this kind of Mount Rushmore stillness. I mean, it's unrelenting. The camera is in there going, tell us, tell us what you feel, tell us what you feel. 
um, and, 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 and show us your heart. And she sort of opens it up. And a funny thing happened that day. She also was ready to, she knew it was this big. I mean, camera was physically right close to her and she knew it was a big moment in the film. But we actually also, we had something scripted and just as I was describing with the, uh, with my distinguished colleagues here, she was ready to improvise. So she was there for two or three minutes and said, what about this? Try this line, do this, whatever. And she's still rock-like. She's like a metronome doing it. So she's hearing all the instruction, no doubt, much of it annoying. Uh, but, but, you know, filters out idiot, director, idiot, director, idiot, director. Useful, I'll try that one. Useful, I'll try that one. And then, and then she finally gets these four lines and she says it. And I said, cut. I said, that's it. Let me, hold on, Judy. I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go and check the thing. I put the headphones on. Listen. OK, play that, play that last one again. I went, no, 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 no. There's something on the fucking soundtrack. What is that? What is that bloody noise? And the sound recorder said, so that is your intake of breath when she did it. Yeah. Oh. And it was me going, <gasps> <laughs> because she was so bloody good. Um, and I thought that that one huge close-up of, uh, of, of Judy Dench was an epic shot in a movie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, so. Back to this side, uh, right here. Uh, you, yes. Again, state your name and your outlet, please. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Lonita Cook, KCTV5. Uh, my question is about drawing out the humor and the narrative. And so the thing that I really loved about the movie is that I didn't think it was m about visiting 1969, but remembering 1969. And I was wondering if you remembered it with so much humor, or did you need to construct that afterwards? Well, it's, uh, that is such an interesting question. I think you're right that it's about m memory. You know, the, the, the psychologists say the facts of our life are less important than how we remember them. Um, and uh, so I was remembering this with a decision to look through the eyes of a nine-year-old I was remembering him from 50 years ago, um, and I was trying to sort of come to terms with a number of things, I suppose. Um, but humor, interestingly, and the, the boys can po possibly talk about Kieran and Jamie, I'd be interested to know if you could put your finger on what you, what you describe the Belfast sense of humor is. But I did want to get that in there as, a, as what, for me, was always a coping mechanism, a sort of an, an undercutting, a, a some, sometimes quite a how would you describe the Irish sense of humor if that's not a horribly difficult question? Uh, it goes against the grain, mm. in a way. I mean, the idea of, uh, you do it a lot, don't you, you two? They're always slagging each other off, and that's a, it's a, it's a sort of form of uh, affection, verbal abuse. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Um, the, the idea that, um, Irish people were such a, mi a mixture, and indeed we're a con conundrum to ourselves sometimes, you know. We don't really know where we're coming from, but we, we, we work on a, a bit of brain and a lot of heart, and um, it, sometimes it leads us down very scary places, uh, and other times it leads to great adventures. Um, this, uh, sorry, my childhood, I was 16 when uh, 69, <clears throat> the year 69 arrived, and uh, I have memories of the thrill of this explosion. Mm. And it was only a day later when I started to see uh, the menace of it, really, at 16. And uh, then how it was going to keep perpetuating itself uh, in a tribal way, one side to the other. That it, it then became very... Uh, very uh, scary, but at the time, you're young, you take risks, you think you're immortal, you know, and, and uh, you do stupid things. But uh, my, my childhood at that time was the sound of the city at night and explosions in the distance and then echoed off the, the hills of Belfast, you'd hear, or gunfire at night. And it, it was like, it was like, it was interesting that Ken has put so much Western stuff in the film itself, because there was a lot of cowboys in Belfast at that time, it has to be said, uh, and they weren't all good, you know. But uh, my memories are, um, <clears throat> they're a mixture. Then you were at school, and the next thing people were using the troubles uh, to get off school. They'd bring up the school and say, there's a bomb in the school, and everybody had a day off, <laughs> you know? Well, they're mixing the truth with how they want to, how they want to play the game. Uh, and thank God we've come a long way since then, anyway. 
Thank you. Okay, who over here has a question for Jude? I want to hear. I want to hear someone. Okay, yes, you in the front row. Uh, uh, gray suit, white mask. <laughs> Name an outlet, please. Hi, Mose Persico, CTV Montreal. First of all, congratulations to all of you. This was a fantastic movie which resonated completely with me. In 1965, my mom and dad, along with my two sisters and I, made the decision to leave the beautiful confines of the Amalfi Coast in Sorrento to move to Montreal, Canada. For the cold of Canada, I still don't understand. <laughs> but it was a personal sacrifice that my dad made because he wanted my mom to join her brothers and sisters, my uncles and aunts, in Montreal. You all touched upon making sacrifices, and that's what this movie's about. But this movie's also about the importance of grandparents. And Jude, I want to ask you, Benny loves his grandparents so much in this movie. I didn't have a chance to grow up with my grandparents because they remained in Italy while the family moved to Montreal. What's your connection with your grandparents now, and how does this movie resonate with you in that regard? Um, well, my relationship with my grandparents is very like buddy with his grandparents in the film. And I feel like grandparents are just some people that you can go to talk to if there's any trouble at home that you don't really want to share with anyone else. And yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I think Buddy in the film really relies on his pop and his granny if he ever needs anything. Jim, what was it like for you to film the scenes with the riots, you know, with all the commotion and chaos? Well, <laughs> it was crazy filming them because just a bunch of things were going on at one time, but it was ex it was so exciting, <laughs> and it was probably one of my most favorite scenes, and I just loved the thrill of everything that was going on, and I was pretty scared as well on the day, just because everything looked so real and like it was actually happening, and um, yeah. Well, great job. Okay, back to this side. Uh, yes, you on the side. Uh, yeah, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hello, uh, Preston Barter with the Denton Record Chronicle and Fresh Fiction. Uh, my question is for Mr. Branagh. Um, I'm, you mentioned that this film is very is deeply personal for you, and I'm curious how much of home is in here for you. Is there anything that maybe as an audience we don't know, we can't detect, but you worked with the production design to put items from your childhood in there? that uh, were very important for you to have in there to make it feel more special? Uh, the, the, probably the most uh, realistic <laughs> depiction was my, was my granny's uh, backyard, um, uh, this sort of informal gentleman's sm smoking room, uh, as it were, where my, you know, the <laughs> my pop used to sit, sit on that loo. It's just a very, very unhygienic, but uh, it's what happened. And he seemed to have, in that backyard, he just had items from all over everywhere. It's just, he had bits of wire, baskets, mangles, bits of piano, bits of saddlery. He just, this like, the guys would come to the back door all the time and they'd bring stuff and it would happen at odd times the day and night, and it was, uh, it was a, an, an, you know, it was like a real depot there. Um, and when, when I went in and saw that, I must say, it, gave, it, put a, it did put a, a lump in my throat. Now, this thing about, it, alongside that garden that was being promised in the house, this thing about inside loos was really very attractive. Uh, you know, it was, it was two inside. We couldn't imagine why you'd have two toilets, but it seemed thrilling, you know, <laughs> and, and they were definitely both inside the house, because I'd had two, also, the, not to get too scatological about this, but they didn't have toilet paper, they used old newspaper. This is not a, not a comfortable way to achieve your ablutions. Um, <laughs> and so, so I, you know, when I, saw, when I saw the newspaper hanging up on the wall, it gave, that gave me a bit of a fright, to be perfectly honest. But that, that bit of the set was very re well realized, yeah. Back to this side. Uh, yes, you in the back, right in the back. Yes, you. Hi, Jeff Howard, uh, KCLV Las Vegas. Uh, Kenneth, this is for you. It's great to know you're a Trekkie. That's just awesome. So I was really excited to see Star Trek in this movie. Also, uh, I'm a classic film fan, so Man of Shot, Liberty Valance, um, High Noon, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Was there any movies that didn't make the final cut that influenced you in this movie? Great question. 
Uh, a couple of movies that didn't make the final kind of fight were, were The Great Escape. Um, uh, we were very, that played a lot in our country on television as well. And uh, Steve McQueen gets a reference, however, you may know. Uh, but him uh, being very um, athletic and, and uh, determined on a motorbike trying to get out of uh, Germany uh, was, was in there for a while. Uh, and The Sound of Music was in there for a while. Um, so the late, great Christopher Plummer and uh, uh, Mindidi and um, and uh, Julie Andrews and and uh, both both those films had a sort of epic dimension. There were other films that we went to where we thought, wow, the, the, all that the, the Austrian mountainside and the the sort of s epic scale of the outdoors in both those films was pretty extraordinary. They're big ensemble pieces. They were long. They were saturated Technicolor pieces. So uh, they were in the movie for quite a long time. But in the end, Raquel Welch. Uh, uh, one out. Uh, bravo to that. Uh, this next question is from our virtual audience. So this is from Lynn Venhaus and for Ken. So audition process for, for Buddy must have been extensive. Where did you find Jude? Um, you may know that uh, the North of Ireland has been, a, in the last 10, 15 years, a great center for film. The Game of Thrones was filmed in, in Belfast and uh, all parts around and many other great shows. So the casting infrastructure is incredibly complicated and impressive. We were able instantly, because we got this together very quickly, to reach out through social media and through drama clubs and schools, all of that very, very instant to find 300 people ready to do a self-tape. And uh, what was the first, uh, what, was it your mum who told you about it, Jude? Or how did you, what was the first time you heard this? Is, um, and did, was there a title or what did you hear? Well, the first audition that I ever did was a self-tape and I go to speech and drama lessons mm. and I do poems and like extracts from books. And my teacher sent through um, this self-tape and I filmed it, and I got called back t like five or six times. And what was it? Was it was it a bit from the movie, or was it a bit from another play, or a bit of what was it that you did to begin with? I think, um, yeah, I think the first self tape that I did was from another movie because yeah. my mum recognised it. Yeah. But then after that, um, a few of the callbacks were the "I don't want to leave Belfast" thing oh, on okay. Zoom. And did you, at any point, did you think, uh, what, what did you think, I really want this, or I don't know, or you don't know how it went, or what, how, how did you feel as you went stage by stage? Well, as soon as I read um, what it was going to be about, like it was about Belfast back in 1969 and the Troubles, I watched a bunch of films and like YouTube videos to understand it, mm. and after watching that, I was like, this is a really important part of history in Ireland where I live, so yeah. I got to do this. Yeah, so yeah. I did hard work and got it. What, what, what? <laughs> Get in line. What was, what, was the scary, what was the scariest part of the process for you, though? Was it, was it right down the end when we all got together, or what was, uh, did you get sort of anxious or whatever, or were you always kind of, kind of feeling, well, easy come, easy go? Well, once I found out I got the part, I was a bit nervous because I've never done anything like this before, so I was a bit like, ooh, how's this going to go? But then... The first day that I ever met everyone, I was just immediately calmed down by how easygoing they all were and how down to earth everyone is, mm. and that really helped. Good. That's how it happened. That's how it happened. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. Roger Friedman, please. Hi. Wait, hang on. Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> uh, Roger Friedman, Showbiz 411. Karen, I wanted to ask you about working with Judy Dench. You were a couple, and you're about 20 years younger than she is. So <laughs> how did that, well, 18, let's say. But uh, it, it's unusual to see that kind of casting. So, and your wife is the greatest actress in the world here. So how, how was that? Yeah, it would have been churlish to turn down the part, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, the, the day that Ken called us all together, we were sat at a table. And uh, Jamie and Katrina and myself were there. and. Uh, and Judy walked in wearing a tiger mask. <laughs> and so we knew she meant business, you know. <laughs> and she gave him this tiger mask and, uh, and, and the light in her eyes was extraordinary. Um, now, to me, it, it was uh, another gift from Ken, really, to get to work that closely with someone who is genuinely uh, thinks on her feet like that, is able to turn on a dime, is able to, her instinct, her... Uh, her truth uh, 
and her wit and her humor. And the thing as well, as I think I've said it before, she's a bit of a rebel. So you've got, in entirety, you've got an extraordinary force of nature and uh, one of the warmest women I've met. Was, uh, for me, it was a great experience. Between herself and this fella here, um, yeah, I was clinging on to both of them, really. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I actually, when I was at theatre school uh, in last century, um, I think I was 19, uh, and uh, there was a Tennessee Williams play uh, in which I had to say the line, I'm 96 years young. Uh, so, yeah, I, I played about 80 years older than I was. <laughs> and since then, I thought it's not a very good idea. Yeah. Oh, there you Get go. Get back to this side. Uh, let's go. Uh, Jim. Hang on. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Jim Ferguson, I'm with ABC in Tucson, Arizona, originally from Chicago. And a little bit like my friend Mose here from Montreal, I experienced the same thing. I'm a first generation Irishman. Uh, my mother was from the south and my father was from the north. So you can understand why I had to learn with the name Ferguson, the song Carrick Ferguson, <laughs> which is featured in the film. And Jamie, I don't know if you know that song, I do. Uh, it's a beautiful song, and Ken, uh, why that particular song? It really hit home with me. Yeah, the, um, it's a version by, by Van Morrison, as you know, who did the, 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 the vast amount of the, the music in it. And it's also the recording where he's accompanied by the chieftains. Um, so that's a north and south recording, you might say. Um, and uh, that, that voice... There's something about those uh, Irish songs. Danny Boy obviously features and has been, um, certainly in my experience, has been murdered regularly uh, in, 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 in my family. It's always the song you start too high, don't you? And then you get to the middle and you're as, oh, God, I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to make it. Um, well, well, or you'll need an extra Guinness before you get to that top note. Um, but Carrick Fergus um, uh, has that same quality of being a, 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 a sort of folk tune, if you like, but you put it in the hands of uh, Van Morrison, whose voice is a sort of 144-piece orchestra <laughs> on, on its own, and then you have the late great Paddy Maloney from the from the uh, Chieftains, uh, you know, on the harp, uh, and then the, the bass comes in. Then you're seeing a father say cheerio, cheerio to his, uh, you know, the uh, it's just the. Um, the combination of the two things. Um, it's so simple. He says, the sea is wide and I can't swim over, um, which is, you know, it just is a fucking, oh, excuse me, is a, is a heartbreaker. <laughs> it's a heartbreaker. <laughs> um, so, um, and so, so the, uh, again, some people, Noel Coward used to dismiss the power of cheap music, I think he called it, but when you, when somebody, like these actors have done, when they go to the, when Van goes to the soul of a song like that, reinvents it, is accompanied by somebody who also feels it, the DNA goes into the soil, and then you have a simple situation, man leaves home, boy at the window. I mean, how many of us, boys, girls, whatever, have been that, that figure at the window? Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a gift to the film, is what it is. We got one more question. Who's gonna take us out with a good one? Who's gonna take us out? You and the blonde, right there, you. Yes, you. Okay, uh, let's get the microphone over here. Hang on, hang on a second. And make sure, once again, to say who you are and where you are from. Hi, um, Jill Pringle, The Eye Paper, um, UK. Congratulations, all of you. Um, but Kenneth, I'm from Liverpool, um, a huge connection with Ireland. And for the longest time, I didn't know you were Irish. So I was so curious to know how you kept in touch with your Irish roots, or did you do that thing that we all do when we're a newcomer to a new place? Did you get rid of the accent quickly? The, uh, no, the, the accent went over the, you know, I'd say two or three years where the, um, 
I, I think what we touched on earlier was this uh, idea that when you're taken away from the big extended family, I think what I wanted to do personally was just disappear. I just wanted to not stick out. I wanted to keep my head down. From a position of knowing exactly who you were, we didn't really know who we were or what we are, or what we were. So m my, my view was just sort of, was, and that became really quite solitary uh, adolescent, very, very solitary. It was really, really only what you might say through, through the family of acting that I came back in theater companies and, and film companies to sort of be back in that sort of um, extended family. But I was back in Belfast for my very first job. Uh, so, you know, 10 years later, uh, I was back on the, on the Albert Bridge um, and, and uh, just a stone's throw from where we had the premiere the other night. And, uh, you know, the, the, I, I think, uh, as they say, in, they say in the film, you know, the Irish were born for leaving, uh, but uh, that leaving comes at a price. And, and um, you know, you, you, I most certainly lost my way for quite some time, I would say. It took me a long way to find my way back home. And with this film, I did. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Belfast is in select theaters this Friday, November 12th. And to everyone on this cast, to this wonderful writer and director, thank you for making a film that truly is a rose by any other name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.